Greetings. You're listening to the Department of Defense Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation podcast series, part two, Military Herpetofauna Project Highlights and Successes. The purpose of this podcast series is to feature the people, projects, and military installations that are conducting exceptional amphibian and reptile conservation, management, and research projects on DOD lands. This episode is all about the Camp Grayling Eastern Massasauga Population Assessment Field Surveys. We hope you enjoy the podcast. This is Matt Kleitch, uh, Natural Resources Specialist at Camp Grayling. And uh, we're going to talk today about some of the some of the herp work that we're doing, um, specifically work with the uh, Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake uh, here at Camp Grayling up in northern Michigan. And this is Jonathan Edgerly. I'm environmental manager for the Michigan Army National Guard. I've uh, been working for the department for almost 20 years. Started as a, a biologist at uh, our other installation in southwest Michigan, Fort Custer. Um, but here today to talk about the, the rattlesnake work we're doing at Camp Grayling. So Matt, you want to you wanna take a second and kind of talk about how we got to where we're at now? I mean, we kind of have a long history of, of working with uh, Eastern Massasaugas at Camp Grayling. And um, you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, pretty, you know, seemingly robust population of, of Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes here uh, at Camp Grayling. And... Um, Work with that species here goes back um, probably almost 20 years or so. Um, Been a pretty good partnership with Purdue University um, and some folks there to uh, to, to do some monitoring and research on that species. Um, Michigan's kind of a bit of a stronghold, I would say, for for eastern Massasauga. Um, Northern Michigan slightly different than southern as far as habitat requirements and kind of some of the sites where that species is found so um you know as far as the that species goes in our part of the state uh you know i'd venture to say we have one of the one of the most robust populations uh in northern michigan if not you know in all of michigan so um pretty healthy population here um we sit, as far as the species range goes, Camp Grayling is situated about 75 miles from the north edge of the, of the species range um, in the United States, and then about 150 miles um, from it, its overall range, which extends up into Canada, a little bit into Ontario. So, so we're pretty far north um, as far as the range for that species. Um, so, per, you know, some similarities, obviously, between our site and others, but also... Um, you know, uh, significant differences, um, especially from some of the southern Michigan sites. What's different and what's unique about uh, this project, and what were the questions that we were really trying to get at um, when we looked into this project? Yeah, so one of the big projects that we have um, is, is specifically our uh, annual population survey. So what that is is it's a, a long-term mark recapture study, uh, and the way we do that is in the springtime when those snakes are just about we try and hit them when they're just coming out of hibernation so when they're emerging in the spring um, we we do a four day long um, kind of a blitz style survey Um, we have a a whole bunch of volunteers that come out and help us do that a whole bunch of conservation partners and and federal and state agencies and universities Uh, we split split folks up into four teams and there's four dedicated survey units Um, so each of those teams surveys one unit per day for the four day survey uh, and basically, you know, they, they go and systematically search those units and try to find as many eastern Massasaugas as they can. Uh, that species is pretty cryptic, pretty well camouflaged. Um, they're just coming out of hibernation, so a lot of times they're a little bit lethargic. So, um, you know, they're pretty tough to find. They, they don't really, you know, jump out. They kind of blend into the, the surrounding habitat and vegetation. Um, so... The surveyors are really working and, and going slowly and methodically through those units to uh, to try and, and locate those animals. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, you know, a lot of the survey work is is kind of happening in a, a somewhat juvenile jack pine forest area, which isn't necessarily your traditional thoughts of where you would find uh, Mad- Massasauga rattlesnakes. And I know at the beginning of our... Um, our research on this population it, it was really uh, it was really news to a lot of, of folks that the 
the habitat and the jack pines was something that wasn't traditionally thought to be great rattlesnake habitat. Yeah, exactly. I worked on um, some of the southern Michigan sites years ago um, with a, with another conservation organization, and you know some of the southern sites are grass dominated fens, kind of prairie fens, next to upland oak savanna. Um, the habitat that we see here at Camp Grayling is definitely more, um, like you said, the summer, you know, they're more in the uplands, which includes a lot of jack pine, real sandy, dry um, sites. And then, you know, they also utilize, especially for overwintering, they'll utilize the edges of some of the cedar swamps, um, conifer swamps, uh, black spruce, things like that. So definitely uh, pretty different than what the southern Michigan sites look like. And, you know, something that I always find annually when I come up and, and participate in this survey is is the number of volunteers that come and participate in this. And, you know, frankly, the smiles on their faces and the good time that, that are had and the camaraderie that's had by the folks um, that participate and volunteer to execute this survey. Can you speak to a little bit more on, you know, who's coming and volunteering, what their level of experience are, and, and where they're traveling from, their association with what groups, because um, that's, I think, a really, frankly, crucial part to make this uh, survey actually happen. Yeah, definitely. Um, typically, we have, I would say, you know, somewhere between 35 and 40 individual volunteers, and um, most of those folks are affiliated with, you know, some years we're counting up to 20 different partner organizations. Um, those include uh, federal agencies, you know, we have some some good partnerships with our, our local Fish and Wildlife Service folks. Um, U.S. Forest Service has had staff out to help. Uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Also our state agency, uh, Michigan DNR. We have both um, some of their Wildlife Division folks and Parks and Rec Division. Um, and then some of the universities as well. One of our primary partners is Michigan Natural Features Inventory. They're affiliated with Michigan State University Extension. Um, and then we also have folks that come out from Purdue, Fort Wayne, University of Michigan, Central Michigan University, um, have some pretty good partnerships with a couple of the zoos as well. We've had, um, the Toledo Zoo the last few years, Binder Park Zoo, um, John Ball Zoo, um, you know, and then some other conservation organizations, uh, some of the nonprofits and then also other DOD folks, you know, we've had uh, National Guard Bureau. Uh, folks out of the G9 in DC that have come out to help. Um, Jay Rubinoff has been here a couple times. Uh, and then other mil military installations. We've had other, other installation biologists come out um, and participate as well. So definitely uh, some great relationships uh, that have formed over that. And like you said, no way we could pull this off without all their support and help on it. Yeah, I'm one of those individuals, you man Lee from, from MNFI has been, you know, with us at, from the beginning on this project. And is integral to make this happen. And, and you know, an interesting Mike Ravisi, who started off as a master's student uh, doing some of those research uh, projects early on, um, ended up coming and working for us at the Michigan Army National Guard at Camp Grayling as a biologist and really kind of started this project. And he's since moved on to other career opportunities, but, but still comes back to us annually and, and volunteers to come back annually and participate and, and be one of, you know, one of the most important people working on this project with us. So um, it really has turned into a, a family of individuals that look forward to this every year, and we are we're so greatly appreciative of their efforts. All right, Matt, so you, you mentioned that the, the different groups, the different teams would go out and perform um, these blitz surveys. Can you kind of walk us through what that looks like out there in the field and, and what transpires when they do find a snake? Yeah, so like I said, we split folks up uh, into four survey teams, and uh, each team is assigned to a survey unit. Um, they they kind of spread out and methodically uh, work their way slowly uh, through those units, looking for eastern Massasaugas. Uh, we record all the data on a Survey123 app, so they have a tablet with them for data collection. So once they find a snake, um, we have a dedicated two dedicated people on those teams. One person is a dedicated snake capture or snake handler and another person um, is the dedicated tablet handler or does all the data entry and um, so a couple things there one with the snake handler we have to be permitted since this is a federally threatened species um, everyone that that handles those snakes has to be under permit so we make sure we're covered there 
Uh, with the data collection, we make sure the data collection person is, is well trained and, and knows all the ins and outs of the data form and how to accurately and completely collect that data. So a snake is found, um, they'll collect some field data, um, ground temperature, use a laser thermometer to take temperature of the snake itself. Um, and then they'll capture that snake. Uh, they'll put it into a pillowcase, tie up the pillowcase, and then that goes into a bucket with a lid. One of the really important things is, um, is marking and recording the location of where each snake was found. So, you know, obviously they'll record the, the GPS location and drop a pin exactly where that snake was found. But we'll also put a flag on the bucket for each individual snake and then also a flag on a, on a close by tree. And the purpose of, of doing that is that once we're done processing and collecting the lab data, we want to make sure those snakes get released exactly at the location that they were captured. Um, so once they capture a snake, it's in the bucket, they have the field data collected, um, they will radio into the lab and we'll send uh, my coworker Cullen, he's normally the, the runner, so he'll, he'll uh, head out into the field and meet up with the team and, and transport that, that bucket with the snake uh, from the field back to the lab for, the, for that additional data collection in the lab. And that, I mean, that's just a couple miles away, right? Because there's, there's a great interest in making sure that the, the snakes, um, of, of course, are removed carefully, taken to the lab, um, get whatever data you need out of them. And then, again, Cullen, with, with great speed and emphasis, <laughs> returns those snakes back to that same exact tree um, that, they were, uh, that they were hiding in there. And, and why is there such interest in making sure that that's done quickly and and put back into that same location yeah these snakes are um like i said we're trying to get them just as they're kind of emerging from hibernation um so typically you know they've come out of hibernation within a week or two of when we're capturing them on the survey um these snakes have very high sight fidelity meaning that you know they're very specific to knowing that you know that they're inside their home range um Previous telemetry work at Camp Grayling has shown that some of these individual snakes will actually go and hibernate in the exact same hole that they did in previous years. Wow. So we want to make sure that we're not moving those snakes outside of their home range or into an area that they're not familiar with um, that could potentially, you know, subject them to additional mortality or risk or, or energy deficits or things like that. So we want to make sure we put them right back to exactly where, where they were captured. Well. Case in point now, we're sitting here in northern Michigan in mid-April and watching the snow fly, and two or three days ago, it was 85 degrees out. So yeah. <laughs> if all of a sudden they, they've emerged and the temperature and the weather turns on them, they need to know where to, to go back and, and get back into that uh, refugia. Yeah. All right, so the snake's brought into the lab in the bucket. Then what? Yep, so then we have a separate team um, that's dedicated in the lab. Typically, there's there's four of us in there, um, and we'll break into teams of two, especially when we get busy so that we can process snakes quickly and, and collect data and, and get them returned to the field. Um, so once they come into the lab, the first thing we do is we uh, we weigh the snakes. They're already in the pillowcase, so we'll, we'll put the entire pillowcase with the snake uh, on the scale and weigh that, um, and then we will dump the snake into a um, kind of a plastic tote bin and there's a there's a foam pad um, in there on the bottom and uh, then we can weigh the the pillowcase without the snake in it and then subtract that difference and then get the uh, get the weight of the snake so that's the most efficient and safest way to do it without us having to actually handle the snake to do that um, so once they're in the in the tote we uh, we will get a length measurement on them as well there's two methods we're using to do that uh, we're comparing those methods, but one is to, we use a kind of a plexiglass shield and we'll, we'll pin the snake lightly underneath that shield. And then, uh, we'll take a marker and just draw on that plexiglass on the midline of the snake. And then we can actually measure the, the line that we drew rather than having to handle the snake to do that measurement. Um, the second way we're doing it is we're taking pictures of the snake digitally. And then we have software that we, that we're using to, uh, to use the picture to take that length measurement. So we're kind of testing that method out um, to see if we can, you know, improve some efficiencies there. 
once uh, once that's done, the next thing we do is we get the snake uh, into a tube. So we have clear plastic tubes. Um, the only time we ever really uh, up up until this point, the snake has really only ever been handled with the tongs, snake tongs, and a hook. So the only time we ever handle snakes by hand is when they're in a tube. And so, you know, we'll get the snake to go up, climb up into the the appropriately sized tube, uh, about a third of the way or more. Uh, once they're in there, you know, the fangs and business end of the snake are in the tube, then we can reach down, grab where the body meets that tube, and then we have the snake, uh, you know, safely within that tube, and we can, we can handle it and do the rest of the data collection uh, that we need to do. So once, it, once the snake's tubed, uh, we'll, we'll record um, an estimated age class. So that's basically, you know, is it a young of the year, uh, sub-adult or adult? Uh, we'll determine sex if it's male or female. We will uh, insert a microchip, so a, a pit tag, uh, which is just a, a very small, about the size of a grain of rice, uh, nine-digit barcode, and that way we can identify those individuals. I mentioned this is a uh, mark recapture study, so we want to be able to identify those individuals, especially when we recapture them in the future. Uh, we'll do We'll swab for snake fungal disease, so we'll, we'll take a uh, cotton tip swab and, and just do body swabs, especially um, really up and down the entire body, but especially if we see any clinical signs, any lesions or anything like that. Um, those get sent off to the lab to, to test for snake fungal disease. Um, and then, you know, really at that point, we're, we're putting them back in the bucket, and then they're, they're getting ready to get transported back out into the field. So you said we're at year five, I guess, you know, looking at some of the information now and some of the data, what uh, what are you finding out? What are you learning? What do you where do we go from here? Yeah, so going into year five um, in 2023. So um, you know, really at this point, we're getting enough of a of a data set established here to um, the to kind of start to do something more with that data. So um, you know, really the the purpose and objectives of the project are to to get a better handle on what is the population size? Um, so how big is the population? Um, you know, what does that population structure look like? So as far as the, the different age classes and sex ratios, um, looking at the population demographics, and then also hopefully be able to model and, and predict some long-term viability. You know, is this population stable and doing well? Is it, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Um, how is that doing? And be able to monitor that over time. Um, and then also, like I said, we do some health health monitoring as well, especially for snake fungal disease. Um, so, you know, ultimately the, the purpose is to to make sure that this population is stable and, and is doing well um, out into the future. So we're starting to get enough of a data set, I think, to, um, to be able to do something and answer some of those questions. You know, and then the question becomes, well... Why does the military, why does DOD fund and, and put priority towards projects like this? And, you know, and I, and I think the, the answer is, you know, the, the more that we can be good stewards of the environment and the natural resources that surround it, um, the more we can protect our mission needs and capabilities that we have as a training facility. Um, we know that this is a, a species that is in decline and is protected and instead of waiting to have restrictions put down on Camp Grayling, let, let's understand what we have, let's understand the natural resources, let's understand the species, and let's see what we can do as a facility to, to shape our training um, to limit any negative effects on this species to prevent those future restrictions. And so, you know, again, I, I've been with the department for close to 20 years now, and you can see the sentiment has changed with with snakes and um, here at Camp Grayling through education through the environmental office working with site command um, inviting individuals to participate in this survey heck we had the, we had the, the adjutant general came last year to our snake blitz and participated and they're really they, they are starting to understand too that you know this is this is important to be good stewards of the land um, you know to, to protect uh, mission capabilities and, you know, our, our soldiers were once upon a time may have run across a snake and had a very negative reaction. Now it's a very positive reaction. And they, um, 
they do what they can to avoid the snakes. They, they reach out to the environmental office to notify them that they, they maybe come across um, a snake in a specific area. So I think the education and the outreach is also a very big part of this, of this project and has gone a long way to, uh, to protect the species. Yeah, I heard someone recently um, kind of sum it up in, in a pretty short sentence, and they said proactive conservation rather than reactive regulation, which I thought, you know, it pretty much hit the nail on the head. You know, we can be a proactive conservation partner, and, and we kind of have a, you know, a responsibility to do that rather than, you know, be in a reactive stage and, and let the regulatory agencies uh, come at it from that angle. So, um, like I said, we have a great relationship with our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff. And, um, you know, really, I think this project is a great example of how we can achieve the military mission while, you know, conserving a, a federally threatened species at the same time. You know, those things are most definitely compatible. Um, sometimes you have to get creative in, in how we do things or and how we approach different issues, but, uh, you know, we're, we're able to achieve both of those missions simultaneously. Yeah, absolutely. As long as, you know, the more each one of those populations know about each other, both the military training population and the snakes population, the more we can, you know, work to de-conflict those two initiatives. And, uh, yeah, I think that's been, that's been a great learning lesson for our site command here on, on Camp Grayling. They've been very supportive of this project. Um, you know, this large population of Eastern Massasauga occurs in a very heavily used training area at Camp Grayling. So, um, this is one that's very important to us that we make sure that, uh, again, that we conserve that, uh, that population, but also protect the mission capabilities. All right. So of course, Camp Grayling is, uh, you know, natural resources program is, is pretty much captured and and guided by the Integrated Natural Resource Management Plan. Can you kind of speak to a little bit how this, this project uh, aligns with that? Yeah, our, uh, our Natural Resources Management Plan, or NRAMP is the acronym, uh, that's uh, you know, our, our overarching management plan. It's, uh, it's pretty comprehensive. It's uh, you know, kind of referred to it as our Bible, so to speak, has uh, you know, everything natural resources related is really captured there. Um, including our all of our threatened and endangered species projects um, including eastern massasauga so so we have specific uh, goals and objectives in our in-ramp that tie you know directly into uh into this project w uh, with eastern massasauga conservation um all of that plan and, and all the objectives in there are also very well aligned with um with things under as a result of the endangered species act so Eastern Massasauga was listed under Endangered Species Act as threatened in 2016. And uh, there was a status assessment done in 2016 um, on that species. And then a uh, recovery plan was, was finalized in 2021. And in the status assessment, it defined a robust population as greater than or equal to, to 50 adult females and a stable or increasing growth rate. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what we're trying to determine by, by doing this monitoring and, and doing this project is, you know, does the population at Camp Grayling um, contribute to, to what, uh, what's in that recovery plan? So, um, so you know, we're trying to, trying to align things and, and, you know, coordinate with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other partners to, to make sure that, uh, you know, what we're doing is, is filling gaps and contributing um, you know, ultimately to the recovery of that species. That's right. When something gets listed federally, the, the goal of, of federal listing is to ultimately be able to delist or recover a population. Um, so some, some species that's easier to do than others, but, uh, you know, that's the, that's the goal. Well, I think you hit on a good point there. It's, it's you know, we as Michigan Army National Guard Camp Grayling are not just collecting this data to put in our file cabinets, right? I mean, we're collecting this data and this information to share uh, regionally and with our other partners. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit more about um, that level of detail and that data that we're, we're providing and, and how we're helping the overall conservation of the species? Yeah, exactly. I, I listed and mentioned some of the partner groups that, that are directly involved um, with the survey and with helping us uh, you know, conduct the annual survey. Um, but we also collaborate quite a bit with, um, there's an Eastern Massasauga working group, and we collaborate with um, 
you know, with that group, which is a really a, a network of, uh, of a wide range of partners and natural resources managers. Um, some of the ones I, I previously listed and, and also um, others that are doing similar projects in other, other sites and other locations and other regions. So, um, so we definitely collaborate and coordinate with those folks, um, you know, and, and share lessons learned, um, share data where that makes sense. And, uh, you know, ultimately, the idea there is that we're all moving in the same direction for the betterment and conservation of that species. So what are some challenges or, or some issues that you've come across um, that make this, this survey and this, this work difficult or, or challenging? Yeah, a couple challenges. Um, one is, you know, it's logistically, it's, it's kind of a party, big party planning event for us. You know, we have upwards of 40 people that are coming in for the week um, to participate in the survey. And uh, the majority of them are going to need a place to sleep and are going to need, you know, meals and breakfast, lunch and dinner. And uh, obviously all the, the safety issues. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's quite the, the logistical, um, you know, challenge to pull off and, and do it do it well and do it safely. Um, luckily, we have uh, uh, some good staff and good support here to be able to do that, uh, especially including some of our range control folks. So one of the challenges is um, scheduling around military training activities. Um, so typically when, we're, when we do this survey in May, um, they, are, they shut down for a week for maintenance on some of these sites. So during that week, we, we have one week to do the, the survey where there's not military training happening. So, um, so we coordinate, you know, very closely with range control um, to, to schedule that and, and pull that off, um, you know, have their full support. They're great to work with. And, you know, that, that goes right on up to, to our leadership and command at headquarters as well. Um, the other challenge for us is being in northern Michigan is the weather. You know, we, like you said, last week it was 85, and now there's snowflakes floating around out there. So, um Early May, we can get any, <laughs> any either end of the spectrum on that, and, and we have. You know, we've had hot days and we've had snow. So um, nothing you can really do about that. We, we plan the best we can, and, uh, and we just plunge forward, and Mother Nature gives us what we get. So, Yeah, and again, I just want to hammer home the importance uh, of the volunteers that participate and how this could not occur without them. You know, Matt, Matt talked about them, them coming and staying here on post and, and us feeding them, but, you know, we're not talking the Ritz-Carlton here. They're staying in, in military barracks and they're getting boxed lunches and they're taking vacation days uh, to come and do this and trudge through the jack pine forest and the swamps of northern Michigan to help us out. And, and I think that really says a lot about um, the individuals that come and participate in this. Uh, you know, they have smiles on their faces. They're having a great time. Um, they're, they're part of something larger than just, just them individually, and I think they recognize that. And we surely appreciate that um, here at the installation and at the Michigan Army National Guard that we have those, those volunteers um, that come and dedicate their time uh, to come help us with this uh, very important project. Yeah, we definitely have a, a good core group of uh, very dedicated and passionate um, folks that help us on this project. So um, definitely appreciate that and couldn't do it without their help. Again, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, National Guard Bureau and the, the Michigan Army National Guard for their continued support of this project. Uh, not only is this important for Camp Grayling's mission training viability, um, but the, is, of course, important for the, the conservation and the natural resource protection of this valuable species within this, uh, this complicated network here in northern Michigan. Thank you for listening to the DoD Park Podcast. We hope you enjoyed learning about the exceptional work Camp Grayling is doing with the Eastern Mossasaga.